Appreciate you being here again and for the opportunity of resuming our study of understanding the will of God. Ruth and I are quite happy to have our daughter Dita here with us today. And she, of course, has not been in on these sessions. So for the benefit of her in particular and maybe the rest of you a little bit in review, we will give a thumbnail sketch of a host of lessons we've already covered in regard to understanding the will of God. Right at the outset, we pointed out that there are actually three different units or sections in Scripture to comprehend the will of God which includes his ideal will, that's his plan. It's always good, full of grace and mercy and truth. And then his allowed will, and that is that man was so created to make choices of his or her own, and that is his permission. And then thirdly, the ultimate will of God which primarily is a demonstration of the fact he is in command. He, his power. So you've got his plan, his permission, his power. In any of our Bible study, we need to keep those things in mind. And we had a lesson or two to show some confusion that people have had by failing to recognize those three portions or compartments of his will. And then in regard moving past some of the material we covered naturally in this survey to his allowed will we found there were three parts to that. In the allowed will there's of course man's will which we've already mentioned our being able to make choices and decisions and selections on our own. But then Sadly, there's the devil's will, and we did some study in regard to passages that relate to the devil's will, and then the third part of that allowed will is God's providential will, and in the booklet, we had a breakdown of three different compartments of God's allowed or providential will on page 20, just page 20 of the booklet, and noted that there were three stages to God's providential will. And that needs to be understood in regard to circumstances and events. One is that God has placed limitations on what the devil could do. We remember we looked at Job and he could do certain, the devil could do certain things to Job, but other things he could not do. And tying that in with 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God's faithful. He'll not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but will with the temptation provide also a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And really I'm not going into it now, but there are three parts to God's uh, providential will just in that section of his allowance. But then secondly, God may allow us to be tempted and tested and tried in order to make better people out of us. James 1, 2 through 4 would be one passage that we looked at. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into manifold trials, knowing that the proving of your faith will work patience or steadfastness. And that steadfastness will make approvedness, and approvedness will give hope and so forth. That's also in the book of Romans. The idea of Job going through what he did isn't just a study of pain and perils and problems, but at the end, you see that Job had a better understanding of God through those experiences. And thus, that's the second stage of the providential will of God. 
He would allow us to be tried and tested because we become stronger that way. And then the third part of that, what if we falter? What if we fail? What if our weakness causes us to go into the valley of wrong and sin and shame? Does God give up then? No, that's the third stage of his providential will. And that is he applies grace and mercy and reaches out to us. And we had a study or two in that regard. In fact, in the booklet, there's one entire sermon that builds off of that particular feature of God's nature. His mercy and his grace, gratitude for the will of God. And then, after that, we moved on to the ultimate will of God, his power and his control, looking at that in varied ways, but especially want us to remember that entwined in that is the fact we must give an account to God. We looked at an old covenant passage, Isaiah 45, verse 18, verses 22 through 24, and the same thoughts, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, is given in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. And we looked at that as a part of the power of God that you and I will submit to him. Mentioned there'd be no atheist in hell because they're going to all believe in God at that point, but we have a time now through his allowed will to make a choice. And if we choose now to be ready, then we can give an account. But then we noted toward our last lesson, really, that strategically related to the ultimate will of God is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we also noted last week that that brings up a mass of confusion, some skeptics, and a whole list of speculation about when Jesus is going to come again. There have been predicted dates and people preparing for a certain year and things like that. We noted that all out of the context of 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 1 through 13. But in that, we put a little emphasis on verse 10, where in regard to the skeptics who would ask, where is the promise of his coming? Peter punched in that thought very clearly, the day of the Lord will come. Verse 10. And then he begins to describe what will happen when Christ does come. However... There has been varied ones in Scripture that have written this idea of the day of the Lord. It's an expression that has applied to God's judgments at varied times down through history. We noted, of course, the days of Noah and that particular incident of the flood that was a day in which God brought judgment upon man because as given in Galatians 6 and verse 5, the thoughts of man's heart had become evil continually. If another generation had been born, they would have all drifted into sin and shame and no respect for God. So that occurred. You remember also just on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, God brought on judgment. We looked at one of those passages in Isaiah, the 13th chapter, verses 6 through 16. We looked at that first in that chapter because there you have in capsule form the nature of God's judgments, terrifying, horrifying, painful. 
And it shows some of the response of people down through those verses. Isaiah 13, 6 through 16. But then we backed up and noted, though that twice says that it's the day of the Lord, hence his judgment. In verse 1 of Isaiah 13, it mentions that that was against Babylon. And then down in verse 17, it even mentions that God would use the Medes as the force and the power to bring down the Babylonian Empire. And we know historically that that actually happened. The Medo-Persian Empire followed the Babylonian Empire. Now the point is, if you just say the day of the Lord and you think of it being the end of time, no, at varied times in Scripture that's given, and we especially looked at verses 6 through 16 to point out that the nature of God's judgments need to be understood to appreciate His power. We raised also the question, well, are there passages then in the Old Testament that result, relate to the ultimate day of the Lord? And we looked at one passage, Zephaniah 1, verses 14 through 18. And the statements in that few verses is too great to be isolated into some part of God's judgments like on Sodom and Gomorrah or something like that. And then right at the end of our class last week, we mentioned that today we would be making a study of Matthew, the 24th chapter. So you might want to be turning to that passage now because it's another one of those passages where there has been confusion related to the second coming of Christ or what is Matthew 24 really teaching. Generally, if you were to just pull out commentaries here and there at random, they relate all of Matthew 24 to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Now, Matthew 24 does deal with God's judgment on the Hebrew people that occurred in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. It's a historical fact. But that isn't all that Jesus gave in Matthew 24. So now, if you have gotten to Matthew 24, we're going to read through most of that chapter for our class today. It will start with their leaving the temple in Jerusalem and the apostles mentioned to Christ about the marvels and the beauty and has he thought of certain things that we don't know all the conversation but verses 1 and 2 identify the fact that they are asking him about his thoughts concerning the temple and Jesus I'm sure shocked them just a little bit because they were speaking of its magnificence a stately Tremendous work of architecture. When he said that there would come a day when not one stone would be left upon another of that dwelling. And that did happen. But it mentions now beginning in verse 3, the question that the apostles then asked Jesus. They likely thought they were asking him one question because they considered if the temple was going to be destroyed, that would be the end of the world, apparently. And that's the way they asked the question, probably thinking of one significant event maybe like on Sodom and Gomorrah, something of that nature. But in reality, they asked Jesus three questions. And if you don't note all three, then you have problem 
understanding Matthew 24. So that's where we are now going. In Matthew 24 and verse 3, Jesus hears the apostle ask this, Tell us, when shall these things be? Now they're referring to his comment about not one stone being left on another in the temple in Jerusalem. When shall these things be? And now that's one question if you stop there, but that wasn't all that they asked. They added, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? In reality, there's a big difference between the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to be looking at in this chapter. And then they added, and the end of the world. Now, putting all that together, they said, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and the end of the world? Because they were running it all together, apparently. But we're going to break down Matthew 24 now, because Jesus answered all three of their questions. That's what we're noting. Question number three, really, is where he starts. And the end of the world. And I might mention, uh, if we have time today, after we get to about verse 34, we'll be noting in verses 35 through 44, Jesus actually comes back to the destruction or the end of time. And how the people need to respond to be ready. But right now, I want us to look at verses 4 through 14, which is the third part of the question, the end of the world. Notice what Jesus said. This is beginning in verse 4. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man lead you astray. Christ knew that there would be some perils and problems and confusion, and he's urging you, me, and certainly them at that time, don't be confused about these matters. Take heed that no man leads you astray. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall lead many astray. It'll happen to a lot of people. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And then he added this, see that you be not troubled, for these things must needs come to pass. Now notice, but the end is not yet. There have been wars and rumors of wars all the way through history. And yet Jesus said, don't think, and yet men have come along during some war and said, this is going to be the end of the world. Some thought Hitler was going to do it, and some thought maybe Stalin, and there's been speculations even in our day. And if you go back through history, it's happened other times when some huge conflict came. People thought, this is the end of the world. Jesus is saying, watch out. Don't let people lead you astray. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and earthquakes in divers places. That gets us now here in Oklahoma, doesn't it? We are blessed with earthquakes about every week, I guess, one, two, or three, but not like the one I might mention that is given in Scripture for the end of the world. There will be one then, and it is catastrophic. Jesus added, all these things are the beginning of travail. And now he comes back seemingly to the apostles, though, to help them prepare for the rest of their life and what's going to happen. Then after some of these things, nation against nation and varied problems among people, then shall they deliver you up unto tribulation, talking to the apostles, and shall kill you. Some of you have heard me mention about when I went into India and would fly in at the airport in Madras. Between Madras, or the airport and the Madras city is about 15 miles. And 
in between is Mount Thomas. And it was supposedly up on top of that mountain that Thomas the Apostle was killed. That's a tradition they have in India, likely accurate. That not only shows how far the gospel had gone during the days of the apostles, but it also would tie in here, and most of the apostles were killed because, and he tells them why right here, you shall be hated of all the nations for my name's sake. And because iniquity shall be multiplied, the love of many shall wax cold. What was it in the days of Noah? People's thoughts were evil continually. A lot of wickedness going on. And the area of iniquity, Jesus said, is going to be multiplied. But now notice what he adds. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Could they have been saved? Or could the ones be saved who will be on this earth with iniquity all around them before Jesus comes? Yes, they could. That goes back to what we've studied of the will of God. Is he going to allow people to be tempted beyond what they're able to handle? Not if they'll look to him. He's still in control. This parallels, incidentally, with Revelation 2 and 10, where he said to one of the churches, and some that were faithful, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Revelation 2, 10. Well, people can yet be saved right down to the final hour. Jesus' blood is not weakened because of man's iniquity. And then he add this, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. So these first verses, 4 through 14, are really answering the part of their question, and what will be the end of the world? Jesus gives them an answer and tells them a lot of things that's going to go on before the end of time. Now, beginning in verse 15, he answers question number one. When shall these things be? That is, that the temple's going to be destroyed in Jerusalem, not one stone left upon another. And he's telling the apostles who would live, some of them, to see that day. Verse 15, when therefore you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through the prophet, or Daniel the prophet. So Daniel the prophet did prophesy some of the day of the Lord activities as it would relate to the temple and Jerusalem. Daniel was at the time he delivered it standing in the holy place. And then Jesus added that parenthetical expression, let him that reads understand. And I might mention, if you wanted to get more information concerning Daniel's coverage of the abomination of desolation, if you want to jot down these passages, you could look in Daniel 9, 27, Daniel 11, 31, Daniel 12 and verse 11, three different times and in three different chapters, he mentions the abomination of desolation. So Jesus is just picking up what David actually gave. And I'm not covering that now. I wouldn't begin to get through with the chapter, but I want to mention this. We've got several good books in our library here at the church. And down in the elder's office, I don't imagine many of you have been in there to browse around. You think that's, I guess, a sacred ground or <laughs> off policy for the rest of you. But anybody can go in there. They don't lock that door. But they've got this set of commentaries that Brother Eddie Cloyer and some of the rest of us have done the writing for the different books of the Bible. 
And so Sellers S. Crane wrote the commentary on Matthew. It's a two-volume set. And the second volume, verses 14 through 28, covers 24, naturally. And if you want to get an enlargement on the abomination of desolation in the day of Daniel, well, you can go in there and pull that out and do your reading. I just thought I'd pass that on so you could do follow up if you want to on what Jesus is referring to here. It's in there. It's in Daniel. I gave you the chapters, but if you went back to read Daniel, you might say, well, what's he talking about? And maybe Brother Chambers' commentary might help you get that understanding if you want to go into that phase of the study. But now let's come back to what else Jesus said in regard to the abomination of desolations. He said, when that comes, let them that are in Judea, not just Jerusalem, but in the country of Judea, in which Jerusalem, of course, dwelt, flee unto the mountains. And that's because it was going to be horrifying. And you wouldn't want to live in the day of the destruction of Jerusalem. No one would want to live in that day. Well, maybe the Romans would have. They were the ones doing it. But he even adds this to indicate it's going to come fairly quickly. Let him that's on the housetop not go down to take out the things that are in his house. Don't spend a lot of time. I guess here in Oklahoma we could parallel it with Channel 9 or Channel 4 or Channel 5 telling us that the tornado's at a given location and the direction in which it's going and we're within the path of it about a mile down the road. How do you feel then? You want to just stand around and wait and look and watch and see it come in? Well, Jesus says, do something quickly. You've heard of even fires and all, and people trying to gather some of their possessions in a hurry and get out of the building. That's what Jesus is talking about here. It's going to be devastating. It's going to be terrible. And if you're on the housetop, don't go back down in the house. And let him that's in the field not return back to take his cloak but woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And he even added this, pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath. Why would you pray for it not to be in winter? Because where did he say flee? You flee to the mountains. I promise you, when you get up in higher altitudes, it gets colder. And he is saying, pray that it not be that. And on the Sabbath, there had been a pattern for many stages of activities around Jerusalem for them to shut the gates on the Sabbath because they had rules on the Sabbath not to travel so far and other regulations. So they shut the gates. Well, if the gate was shut in Jerusalem, you couldn't get out of the city. And he is saying, flee to the mountains. So these are just some common sense precautions to avoid the tragedy of that day if you would have been living in Jerusalem at that time. Neither on a Sabbath. Now we'll pick up the text again. For then shall be, here's the reason that you hurry, there shall be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world unto now. No, nor ever shall be. That's pretty heavy because there have been bad things already happened and there have been bad things happened since then. He added, and except those days had been shortened, no flesh would have been saved. 
but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Whatever the Roman military powers did to bring down the temple and Jerusalem was quick and decisive, but it did end. Josephus mentions about blood flowing in Jerusalem at that time, and uh, there are some descriptions which indicates what a devastating, horrifying group of events were involved when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. Now that covers the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple when Jesus said not one stone is going to be left upon another. So what he predicted in that day which would have been in the earlier part of the century, did occur in 70 A.D. It was real. I'm sure we're not surprised that Christ told the truth concerning that. Now, I want you to look. I guess it's in your translation. I know it is in the American Standard, and it's in the Greek. The next word after... This mentioned that those days shall be shortened. It says, then. Take that then and make it as grammatically we would expect it to be. What happens after the destruction of Jerusalem? Then these things are going to be happening. And what he's about to give in the next few verses relates to the time from the destruction of Jerusalem until the signs that are going to be given of Jesus coming. And we don't have those signs yet. We're here over 1,900 years past that time. So in the next three or four verses, he's going to scope a big chunk of history and mention what would be happening after the destruction of Jerusalem. Then, that's the next word. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is the Christ, or here. Notice what he said, believe it not. Did you know there have been down in history where one said Christ was? And they have pinpointed places where he was. Exactly. And Jesus said, do what? You believe it not. And we'll explain why he says it. He's going to say it again in just a moment. <coughs> For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. I might mention those are the very terms that are related to biblical miracles also. Does the devil have any power to show signs and wonders? He sure does. And there'll be people who make claims for this and that. I have mentioned before, I can watch a magical show on TV, and I'm just dumbfounded trying to figure out how in the world they're doing it. I know it's hocus pocus somewhere, but I can't figure it out and I can't detect it. Over in Lubbock, Texas, we had a brother that I went to school with in Abilene Christian. He was a preacher of the gospel, but he is also a magician. And uh, when I'd see him, I'd say, Bill, what's your latest trick? And uh, I still think of this one the most often. He reached in his pocket and he pulled out two little foam rabbits cut out just in foam rubber. And he said, Dayton, you know, you get a couple of rabbits like that together and, man, they just multiply. And uh, I was watching his hands, I thought, but he opened them up again. And there's about six or eight little bitty rabbits around those two. I don't know where they came from. I couldn't see any of them anywhere. Well, there are signs and wonders, a lot of things I can't explain, but I know what Jesus said. And if we'll take what he said, we don't have to worry whether we know all that or not. Notice, 
There will be many things showing great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, members of the body of the Lord. Behold, I've told you beforehand. If therefore they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, go not forth. Behold, he's in the inner chambers. Then what did he say? Believe it not. Now, I'll tell you in just a moment why he said that. He gives here this expression that might confuse us a little bit. For as the lightning cometh forth from the east and is seen even unto the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, if you turn to Revelation 1, verse 7, it says when Jesus comes, every eye shall see him. So if there's someone coming along and say, well, go down in the wilderness and you'll find him. No, don't you worry. When he comes, we've got this promise, Revelation 1, 7, every eye shall see him. And I don't hardly understand that. How could someone in Choctaw, Oklahoma, see the Lord come and the people in India on the other side of the earth see Christ come? And I can't give you a definite answer, but I know God's greater than we are. And it says here, every eye will see him. Now, I'll give you a little interesting incident that might help clarify it in just down-to-earth terms. I was teaching a class at Sunset. Had about 400, I think, in that class. And we had people who were visitors and all. In a congregation of 1,800 members, you can have a fairly large Bible class. And when I had finished, some came up, as they often do, and were talking to me about things we'd studied in the lesson. And one brother came up and said, Dayton, sure it was good to hear you tonight. And said, in fact, I enjoyed hearing you last Sunday, too. And I said, uh, I wasn't out last Sunday, and he said, yeah, yeah, you, I, I, I heard and saw you last Sunday. I said, where? He said, in California. I said, I was not, it. you're talking about one of the other teachers here in the school. I wasn't in California last week. He said, yes, you were. I saw you, and I heard you, and it was a good lesson. And then he grinned and he said, you remember when you and Carl Mitchell and Ted Kell did a home seminar at Walnut Creek in California? I said, yes, that was about five or six months ago. And he said, well, do you remember they videotaped that? And I said, yeah, they were. Well, he said, those tapes are going up and down California now and they're using them at different congregations. And where I was in California last week, you were the ones that were teaching the class. Well, now that's kind of a ridiculous parallel, I guess, but was I in two places? Well, in that sense, he heard me and he saw me. And that's with man's little manipulation and technical procedures. Hal back there in the sound booth can appreciate it a lot more than we can as to the particulars involved of making up material and turning it into a disc now, uh, which wasn't done at the time that had happened, but they did make video cassette of the lectures we did there for about three or four days. Now, I don't want to get so far off of this that we're missing the point. Jesus said, watch out. There'll be people claiming that Christ is here and Christ is there. And his basic answer was, believe it not. Because when he comes, every eye will see. And we won't have to worry about getting information from someone across town or something, or across the state or another country. Now, beginning in the next verse, verse 29, he actually has covered from the destruction of the temple and the terrorizing impact it'll have in 70 A.D. beyond us because we're still living and Christ has not returned yet. 
But do you remember when they asked him, they asked him three questions. When will these things happen, the destruction of Jerusalem? And then what will be the signs of your coming? Now look in verse 29. Because that's what he starts answering in verse 29. Do you see why you've got to be careful reading in here? If you don't pick up the different sections, you have confusion. And many have thought that all of this had to do with the destruction in Jerusalem. And I'll give you a verse in a moment that will make you think, well, maybe it was. But I'll try to give an explanation at that time. He's giving the answer to the second part of their question. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, which days? When some will be saying Christ is here or Christ is there and Jesus said don't believe it. From the days of the destruction in the temple in Jerusalem down to his coming again. And I don't know when that's going to be. Which is also what Christ says here in just a moment. But he said, there's going to be some coming. And he says that when the Son of Man comes, it'll be like the lightning from the east to the west. Everybody will see it. What shall be the signs of thy coming? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, it's been covered in verses 23 through 28, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now there are terms similar to this, figurative expressions, of the nature of God's judgments that's given even in the Old Testament. But we're going to come to something here in a moment that makes it pretty evident that this is the final judgment that he's leading up to. And he's saying these are the signs that relate to his coming. The moon will not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens <coughs> shall be shaken. And then, when those things are happening, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. How many? All the tribes. And how many will see? They shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. You look in Acts, the first chapter, <coughs> verses 9 through 11, and that's exactly how those two told the apostles that he's going to return like he went away in the clouds. It bothers me a little bit in one of our song books. I can work through it. But one of the old songs, On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise, uh, it's not going to be a cloudless morning when the dead in Christ arise. But maybe they were thinking of something else in a figurative expression. I'm just saying, got to watch what you sing sometimes. But he will, you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send forth his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. You turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 18, and it mentions that when Christ comes, there will be the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and the dead shall be raised. We that are alive that remain shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Very same thing is yet mentioned right here. The trumpet is going to sound. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds how far will the gathering include? From one end of heaven to the other. Nothing like that occurred in 70 A.D. It wasn't that massive. Then he starts and says, Now from the fig tree 
learn her parable. When her branch is now become tender and puts forth no, its leaves, you know that the summer is nigh. Well, we know out there now our trees have lost their foliage or leaves, and we know that up about probably March, April, somewhere in there, they're going to come back. That's what he's talking about here. You can predict some of the time because of things that are occurring. Now, he's just been saying the moon will not give its light, the stars will not. When those things start happening, you know what? That the Son of Man is coming. Even so, you also, when you see all these things, the things he's mentioned in verses 29 through 31, know you that he is nigh even at the doors. Then the next passage says, this generation, which generation? Most have thought he's talking to the apostles, so it related to the apostles themselves, and so they tied in with the destruction of Jerusalem. No, he's talking about the generation that will see the signs that were given starting in verse 29. That generation, it won't be a two-generation involvement in the judgment. It's going to come quickly. Jesus will come quickly. And every eye is going to see him. And that generation, this generation, shall not pass away till all these things be accomplished. And then, starting at that point, Jesus gives the plea, stay ready, which we've already noted in our study last week from other passages of Scripture, like it's given in Matthew 24, 38 through 42. We looked at that last week, and Mark 13, 33 through 36. Those passages and some others we could have listed says, be ready because you don't know the time. Now, that's what he's going to say beginning in verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Now that sounds like 2 Peter 3, and it sounds like the second coming of Christ. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour, do you get again the suddenness idea? It's a day and it's an hour. Christ's second coming. That day and hour knows no one, not even the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. Last week we mentioned the beautiful summation by the gospel preacher Benjamin Franklin when he said, a faithful Christian is ready at any time for Christ's coming are not coming. If he does not come, we're not surprised because we don't know the day or the hour. But if he does come, we're not surprised because he told us to be ready. <coughs> and that's the beautiful message that Christ is emphasizing right here. He says, as were the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they knew not, until the flood came and took them all away. So shall be the coming of the Son of Man. It will be unexpected. Over in Peter, 2 Peter 3, we didn't look at that much last week in that part, but he said he'll come as a thief. And that's going to be the thought Jesus is going to give right now. As he adds, then shall two men be in the field. One is taken and one is left. Do you remember in 1 Thessalonians 4 that I mentioned briefly a moment ago, it said that we shall ascend to meet him in the air. One shall be taken and another one is left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One is taken and one is left. I tell you, you can read by that and not realize what 
the reality of that emotion would be. <laughs> you standing here talking to someone and all at once they take off. What would you think right then? It would get your attention. And uh, Jesus is using terms that we can read them easily. Experience them dramatically. But then that punchline, watch, therefore, for you know not on what day your Lord cometh. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what watch the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have suffered or allowed his house to be broken through. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in an hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. This uh, is not all of the 24th chapter, but I hope we've covered enough. The other verses just enlarge on what we're looking at right now in regard to being ready on that day. And then the 25th chapter will go on and give other coverage of the judgment day and some sobering thoughts about being ready. But that's in that realm of the ultimate will of God because I guarantee you, Trump wouldn't be able to stop Christ if he wants to come. <laughs> and neither can that fellow that's a leader in North Korea. These are things that are going to be so powerful, so impressive, and so real that it will hit human beings with the most sobering impact that you can imagine. Why did God plan it that way? So you and I'd stay ready. So we'd behave ourselves. So we would think of him, we're breathing his air all day long, every day of every week, walking on his earth, and we do need him. And if we can keep those thoughts foremost in our mind, it might help us to do what then is given in Ephesians 5, that's the source of this study, where Paul said, be not foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That's what we've been trying to do is understand his will. I actually have about three or four minutes now, and I mentioned that in our next studies, we will be involved with further discussions of especially the second coming of Christ and the judgment. A number of verses we've not looked at yet, and some of them need to be noted because they just help to bring into focus more clearly not only the will of God, but how we can be ready when he does see fit for Jesus to come back. Or... The other side of the picture is, as we've noted in some of our study, the frailty of the flesh. S several of us here have got enough gray hairs already. We're not going to be around here much longer. And the allowed will of God that is in the middle, where we can make choices, and we can still do that. We can do that till the day we die. But we won't have that privilege after that. So we better make the right choices now and not try to work it out after we die too late. So we will proceed in that manner. Now, there's one thing I want you to be thinking about. We have that gathering of all the congregations coming in here, or not all of them, we sure couldn't handle that. But the three or four around here, you remember, they have an end-of-the-year get-together, and it'll be on a Wednesday night. I think it might be best if that night we come to the late service. Is that all right with you? And we would not have the early bird class that week. 
So when you hear it announced Sunday again, try to keep that in mind. And uh, I, I'm not trying to get out of teaching. I prefer to keep <coughs> continuity going. We don't have very good arraignments when we just meet once a week. Anyhow, we've got a whole week to forget what we said last week. And if you like I was teaching at sunset all of those years, we met five days a week. Well, it wasn't far from Friday to Monday, and that was the longest gap. And all the other days, we'd just go home, stay up till midnight, and come back early the next morning and start again. And uh, that's the best way of teaching because you have continuity of thought and you can cover so much more material. I've spent quite a bit of time, some even today, in a review of what we've done because we've got the weak gap to forget what we studied. Plus, you've got different classes on Sunday to what this is, and uh, you can get the two mixed up. Uh, uh, teaching methods, they're quite interesting. But uh, I'm just saying on that particular Wednesday, now I think we've got one Wednesday before that, and we'll go ahead and meet, and we'll continue our study just as we did today. But then that next week, uh, we will either not attend or all come at 7 o'clock at the later hour. Appreciate you being here. And if you have questions on some of this that we're covering, well, what was meant by this phrase or that statement or why did you say this? Anything like that, be sure and see me after class. I like to have discussion class, but streaming these lessons, it's hard to get your thoughts out there through the mic to the people who ever are listening outside of here. And thus, if you do have questions outside of class, stop me I'm, or call me. Uh, we'll be happy to talk with you further on any of the things we've been discussing. You are dismissed for today.